Welcome to Future Hindsight, a podcast that takes big ideas about civic life and democracy and turns them into action items for you and me. I'm Mila Atmos. It's 2024, and the future of America is in your hands. Democracy is not a spectator sport. So we are here to bring you an independent perspective about the election this year and empower you to change the status quo. We've had a number of conversations about climate, whether that's with grassroots activists to build climate-resilient neighborhoods, policy experts on the role of state legislation, social scientists on the power of misinformation by big oil companies, and of course, climate scientists themselves, and even physicists. We are a hopeful podcast, so today we're going to talk about all the good things that are already happening, or very much within reach, to make decarbonization real, while also living in a sustainable manner on this planet. Our guest is Bill Weir. He's CNN's chief climate correspondent, He hosted the CNN original series, The Wonder List with Bill Weir, earned a news and documentary Emmy Award for his special report, Eating Planet Earth, The Future of Your Food in 2022, and Columbia Journalism Review called his 2020 CNN special report, The Road to Change, one of the very best pieces of climate journalism ever run by a mainstream U.S. news organization. His first book, Life as We Know It Can Be, is out now. Welcome, Bill. Thank you for joining us. Oh, Mila, it's so great to sit with you. I love the, the theme of your show. It's not a spectator sport. we got to mix it up in the democracy. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> we, we have to get in there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so we all know we need to decarbonize. This is not a secret. We need to slay what you call carbon Godzilla. Right. And one reason I think we have not taken more action is because there is a disconnect between what's happening and the way we perceive it. And one of the things that you mentioned in the book, for example, is you wondered if we would be less self-destructive if oxygen, methane, CO2 were visible in technicolor, (laughs) right? And you also share a staggering statistic about how much extra heat the oceans absorb. I feel like we should start with how bad it actually is. Sure. How would you describe Carbon Godzilla? I would describe Carbon Godzilla as sort of the law of unintended consequences. In the very beginning, uh, when humanity evolved to the point with our big frontal lobes, where we were finding new forms of energy sort of under every rock, physically and and metaphorically. And at first, it was helping us do heavy lifting. (laughs) It built the modern world, extended lifespans. But when it got too big, it started destroying everything we love. It's killing our fish. It's ruining our skiing resorts. It's changing our food supplies. And it's creating these crazy water cycles and storms. And so we should go get mad and kill that thing. We should, you know, do our best to chop up that Godzilla that's already in the sea and the sky and bury it back underground where it came from. That's really what carbon capture is. And the staggering statistic about the energy imbalance, because every fuel that burns, whether it's a briquette on a grill or exhaust coming out of a truck, adds to this, you know, blanket of planet cooking pollution around us and throws off the energy imbalance. Before the Industrial Revolution, it was sort of homeostasis. Sunlight would come in, reflect out, and it created this Goldilocks planet Earth. But now it's between 5 and 15 Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs a second are being absorbed by the oceans. And that's such a staggering thing to think about. You know, the oceans are so big, and they have really been masking a lot of this warming for so long. They're absorbing 90% of that heat. So on land, you know, it's obviously getting more extreme now, but it's easy to ignore. And when a big event comes, we have the mindset as homo sapiens, like, whoo, that was a rough one. Good thing we're back to normal now. You know, there's always next planting season. There's always next spring break. That Maybe that one will be better. When I think it's time for us to all come to grips with the idea that the Goldilocks Earth we all grew up on is gone. We've left that. And we don't know what kind of planet will replace it yet or how the systems work. And everything we built to thrive on the old Goldilocks Earth is not going to work so well anymore. Some will, but we need to rethink sort of every aspect of life. And, you know, at first I resisted the climate beat. I came up as a journalist, as an anchor, covering politics and Hollywood and everything in between. But when we created a climate desk at CNN, I realized this is the one beat that includes everything. (laughs) You know, it's food, 
clothing, shelter, transportation, energy sources, foreign policy, health policy, the economy, all of that is tied to a planet in balance. And for so much of my life, the conservation, natural conservation debate was framed around, well, if you care about Earth, you got to go live in a yurt, you know, off the grid (laughs) and eat tree bark. Right. But we are now at a point in human history Or after a century and a half, when the cheapest fuels available to us, you know, it went first from dung or wood to peat to whales. We used to burn whales for light, you know, which in future hindsight (laughs) seems silly. (laughs) But for the first time ever, the cheapest fuels humanity has ever known is now renewable. It's sun and wind. It's onshore wind and sun plus storage, solar plus storage is booming. And so the point I'm trying to make is that... We can make adjustments in our lives that strip away the waste that that makes Carbon Godzilla bigger Mm -hmm. without noticing, you know, big sacrifices in our lives. Right, right. That's debatable depending on how how much people care and what things, but I just think we've been telling the wrong stories. And ultimately, we are made of stories. Traditions are based on just stories we agree upon in the moment, and they're always under revision. Yes, 100%. Well, so one of the stories you told just now is about how after a climate crisis event— People just move on. They're like, oh, there's another cycle of planting or whatever it is. And most people who are not directly affected by a climate disaster walk around basically ignoring the crisis, even though we're all participating in it. And moreover, the fossil fuel industry has successfully sowed doubt about the science and is continuously busy lobbying in states and in Congress. There's a lot of misinformation to dupe the average voter. So it makes for a really complicated picture in terms of how we can do this together, right? right? So I think it makes it difficult to know what an everyday person can do because we're told that we should stop using plastic straws, for example, (laughs) you know, making it a personal responsibility to take on decarbonization. But stopping the use of plastic straws is not going to help us decarbonize in a serious way. Right. So there is a really tenuous connection between democracy and climate resilience, and you have covered politics, how would you describe the gap between public demands to address the climate crisis and public policy? Okay, that's a good one. There's a term that actually gave me a lot of hope. I was supposed to turn this book in two years ago, and due to things, I kept kicking it down the road, and I'm so glad I did because it's so much more hopeful now. Enough stuff happened. I learned enough about what's happening in the real world to give me more hope than dread about this stuff. And it still can get scary because it's a serious problem. But I learned a term called pluralistic ignorance, which is highlighted in a study that a bunch of colleges did. I think Yale was in front of it. In 2022, if you'd ask the average American... Guess what percentage of your fellow countrymen and women care about climate and and meaningful action for it? And regardless of party, the answers for most people is like 33 to 40 percent. In reality, it's 66 to 80 percent. Pluralistic ignorance is the perception that you are outnumbered two to one by people who don't think about this problem the same way, when in fact the opposite is true. Right. And there's a recent polling that Heat Map, which is a great website, Robinson Meyer does, and they polled a thousand people. Ninety percent of Americans support domestic manufacturing, which is good for decarbonization. Let's get cleaner factories on home soil. They support tax incentives to make homes more energy efficient. Eighty five percent of people support that. Eighty one percent support research into carbon dioxide removal and 80 percent into investing in public transportation. So I think the public gets it more than we give them credit for. And the politics are so bad around this and they've been so manipulated for so long that just the words climate change People glaze up over it or they lean in or they express fear and they don't know what to do about it. We haven't had just the adult conversation about how we deal with the psychology of this. And that's a huge piece of this. When you realize that the Goldilocks earth I grew up on is going away for better or worse. It could be better, which is the point I'm trying to make uh, in many ways. Some damage is baked in. But I also want people to realize That the majority of the problem these days, you know, you can blame the the law of unintended consequences for uh, our great grandparents give them a pass on that when they were digging coal to to power their lives. Now everyone knows better. And the decision makers around this problem, the people who live in the C-suites at the biggest fossil fuel, petrochemical companies, the petro states around the world, you could fit those people 
uh, in a small sort of tennis auditorium or a few, you know, Greyhound buses. Mm -hmm. So that's where the majority of it, and that change is only going to come from new politics, from new consumer demands, from loss of public license to do these things, to have business models that actively destroy the earth. But on the personal level, I think the more we just look around our homes and say, oh, I wonder what my home efficiency rating is if you're thinking about a remodel, you know? Yeah, a lot yeah. of people don't have the luxury of just, well, I'm going to rebuild everything in my life to make it carbon neutral. That's just not practical. But by plugging into sort of the stuff at the bottom of your pyramid of needs, you know, air, water, shelter, it just within your communities and talk to people. Because the other big thing that came out of these Yale studies about perception is that the people who really care about this topic rarely talk about it. Right. And they don't yeah. want to be the buzzkill at the, the dinner party. <laughs> yes. You look but, like a hippie. <laughs> you look like a hippie. Yeah. And people don't want to be a hippie. Exactly. And it's so, you know, it's, it's so easy to just sort of identify somebody by their concerns as, oh, well, you must be this brand of politics. And I don't, right. you know. Yeah, yeah. Whereas it what renders I've people found, just one dimensional. Exactly. Yeah. But what I have found, and I've been surprised again and again, I have such a luxury of my job of traveling the world and the country to explore natural or unnatural disasters or new ideas and people trying to build more resilient communities, I try to go in completely neutral as to knowing that these terms are loaded and that people are going to get their back up if I say, so, the planet is warming up. What are you doing about it? You know, like naming and shaming and all of that sort of thing. I have found that people genuinely care about the same things once you get past that initial layer of political force fields and armor and start talking about What's your favorite fishing hole? How has it changed since you were a kid? Yeah. Hey, did you know that that plant over there is responsible for this? And maybe we should get the neighbors together and figure out what's in our air. What I'm trying to argue is, is that it's the old phrase of think globally, act locally. Mm -hmm. A lot of people just get hung up on the thinking globally. It's mm -hmm. so easy to these days. Yeah. I'm thinking it's a lost cause. If I have to worry about what Vladimir Putin is going to do. Yeah, it feels overwhelming. My, it's overwhelming. But... All politics is local or personal. And if you bring it down to just your environment, you know, your local air, water, energy mix, and who's on your utility board, right. and what kind of levers are being pulled, and digging into that layer of democracy, I think way more good for the planet will be done at the utility board, yes. <laughs> state water commissions, local levels, than the diplomats we see gathering for COP29, you know, or right. these global I conferences. Know. <laughs> the COP29, <laughs> the, the you know, the continuous plans for more plans and more thinking, more plans, more thinking. But you're right. I think this is totally an overlooked area to tap into your local utility and make sure that there you show up to the public hearings yes. and demand the things that you want. Because if the public says, we are paying you every month for whatever we're consuming, electricity, gas, let's say, and we don't want you to do this anymore. Yeah. It's, it's a totally different kind of conversation. Totally. And Mila, you can motivate people in different ways. You know, I learned recently, you know, in this job, and I feel so stupid for not knowing it sooner, our utilities, our power companies are the opposite of capitalism. You know, we think we're living in a free market economy. No. These are legal monopolies where they are guaranteed a certain rate from the state or the municipality to provide this power. And their only incentive is to build out new infrastructure so they can raise rates. It's not to get more efficient. It's not to retire that old cloud belching coal fired power plant and come up with some new exciting energy ideas. So that takes the customer showing up at meetings and really getting involved in ways. And not everybody has that personality. But the people who do, oh, we need you now more than ever. <laughs> right, right. Well, so you, you mentioned this earlier about what you can do in your own homes. Yes. And this really struck me in your book, and this connects directly to our conversation here about utilities. You know, most of us don't know what the technological advances have been that are mm -hmm. available to us, within reach for us, that are inexpensive, or if even if they're not inexpensive, are worth the investment. So, for example, I want to note here that... In late March of this year, Representative Ocasio-Cortez and Senator Bernie Sanders reintroduced the Green New Deal for Public Housing Act, mm -hmm. which aims to invest up to $234 billion over 10 years 
to transition the entire public housing stock in the United States into zero-carbon, highly energy-efficient homes, dramatically improving, of course, the living conditions for nearly 2 million people in public housing across the country. And hearing something like this, you watch the press conference, you know, it sounds like pie in the sky. But actually, there have been many innovations in energy-efficient homes since the OPEC crisis in the 70s. And I was really struck by the example of the passive house that yes. you talk about in Colorado and also the home efficiency rating system, which I didn't know existed. Yeah. So tell us more about how these homes work and connecting to, like, what's in it for us? You know, sure. how much money can people save? Absolutely. I got really excited about this. I, I nerded out on passive homes. This, as you say, started in the 70s during the oil embargo. At that time, some very smart people in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, the university there, got together and thought, well, if we can't up our fuel supply, let's lower our demand. What if we designed a home for a Midwestern chilly climate and see if we can knock the energy use down by two thirds. And what they came back with was basically a modern version of a Pueblo style home that you see in the Southwest with thick, really well insulated walls and then ideally positioned towards the South. So this tightly insulated home with triple glazed windows would catch all the free sunlight. And it's a box of sunshine, clean sunshine. And they built a couple models and then a few more popped up in Massachusetts and proved the theory that this is amazing, that, that you can build a home in a chilly climate if the insulation is tight enough and sometimes body heat or the heat of your appliances is enough to warm the house and you don't need a furnace. And we built homes with skinny walls and giant air conditioners and furnaces when it should be the other way around. And Jimmy Carter back in the day, you know, of course, is remembered for putting on a sweater and telling people to turn the thermostat down. And that, that, again, the message of austere suffering when he could have taken off the sweater and said, hey, America just invented the sun house, free boxes of sunshine, free heat from sea to shining sea. But then the Reagan administration came in, they took the solar panels off the White House and energy efficiency sort of dried up as an idea in my lifetime early on. Meanwhile, a, a German professor took that idea, built the world's really first truly passive house. He called it that because of the passive energy it absorbs. It's, it's a miraculous way to think about it. And I've been traveling around to places that are trying to emulate, and it's taking off. Contractors who are in this space now are booked up for years. There are ways to retrofit homes now. You know, maybe you live in an old 100-year-old Victorian somewhere where you can't insulate it the way you will. Well, you wrap the outside in sort of a tea cozy for homes, and then you can put any kind of finish on the outside that you want to match the neighborhood. A passive house, people worry like, am I going to stew in my own exhaust? You know, can I open the windows in a passive house? All of that. Well, the biggest piece of a passive house is just an air ventilation system, a smart one, that pulls clean air in through the bedrooms and living room. But before it does, it uses the heat or energy from the exhaust air to either heat or chill that as it comes in and then exhausts out through the kitchen and, and bathrooms. And the most striking thing is when you use a thermal imaging camera that just sees heat, right, and you aim it at your typical American home, the thing is glowing because all of the heat waves that are leaking out of the windows, bad insulation, leaking here and there. A well-constructed passive house just looks like a black hole with maybe one little square of light, and that's the vent, you know, where the air is coming out. And so a gentleman who was inspired by the German engineering of passive home construction decided to try to build the first net zero neighborhood in America. It's called Geos, Arvada, Colorado. I met residents of this neighborhood whose electricity bills are $4. And that's the cheapest fee. That's just a fee that's built in. It could go less than that. Other places around the country that are doing net metering, these homes are producing more energy than they use and they're selling it back into the grid. I was just visiting a neighborhood down in Florida, sort of a resilient community with batteries in every home and, and just enough solar. But because the insulation is so good, you don't need much solar to power this thing. Mm -hmm. And he says the premium is 5 to 10 percent. But if you put that into your mortgage, you finance that and the savings you get from never paying a gas bill again. Yeah. And, oh, by the way, maybe your panels are also fueling your vehicles. Mm hmm which are also a backup battery system. You know, right. if we think about it's it holistically, it is a virtuous cycle. It is a virtuous cycle. It's yeah. a great, great term. 
And I never thought about this. I had a cabin up near the Appalachian Trail at the tip of New Jersey, 100-year-old house. And I put new siding on the outside because I wanted it to look better. And meanwhile, there are drafts in the winter that would shoot up our pajama legs, you know, for the <laughs> leaks in the floor. And if I could do it all over again, I would have really concentrated yes. on tightening that baby I have a leaky house up. like that, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You asked you about the home efficiency rating system. Her score is like the higher the number, the worse it is, basically. And my HERS score at that house might have been a 70 or something. To qualify for a passive house, you have to be in the, the low 20s. The folks I met in Geos and Arvada, their HERS score was like negative six. You know, yeah. So their house is so tight. And another selling point these days is that because of filtration, air filters on a passive house during wildfire season when the smoke you know, is visible, a passive house can have the cleanest air in your zip code. And... All of these things add up in big ways, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're taking a short break to hear from a podcast we think you'll enjoy called What Next? And we'll be back with Bill in just a moment. Do you ever feel like there's nothing new in the news? You know there are urgent things happening in the world around you, but all you hear is noise. That's why we made What Next? Our goal is to tell you the stories you haven't heard before. Or maybe a different side to the story you thought you already knew all about. I'm Mary Harris, the host of What Next? And I love my job because it helps me cut through the noise of the news. And then I get to bring it to you. Together, we can figure out what next. And now, let's return to my conversation with Bill Weir. Let's talk a little bit about public policy, because... One of the Biden administration's biggest victories is the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022. It commits $783 billion to make the single largest investment in climate and energy in American history, advance environmental justice, secure America's position as a world leader in domestic clean energy manufacturing, and achieve a net zero economy by 2050. So I just paraphrased all this from the Department of Energy website. And honestly, it sounds a lot like expensive consultant speak. But since you are a climate reporter, and you just told us this beautiful story about the passive houses in Colorado, what change have you seen in real life since the passing of this bill two years ago? What's it doing for the taxpayer? Well, the taxpayer who is properly motivated and educated on on the various incentives, it basically means that clean energy is on sale everywhere for everyone. So if you want to tighten up the insulation on your home, there are ways to do that. There are tax credits for decarbonizing everything from your house to your car. And they're really trying to incentivize that and connect the dots with people's lives. And, you know, right now, fossil fuel companies, the most profitable companies in human history, are still getting billions in direct and indirect subsidies, right? And so to try to put a thumb on the scale for those who want to decarbonize a little bit, to help them. And so depending on where you live in the country, there are various in state and and national incentives as well. But what is coming up behind them that is not as visible that I get to see and which just fills me with so much joy every time I do one of these stories are all the entrepreneurs who have been uncorked with all this public. And as a result, private financing has chased the Inflation Reduction Act. I'll give you one example. Met a great guy who started a company called Antora. He's a public school kid out of Oregon who fell in love with science and was worried about climate, you know, in junior high school. Started working on solar panels in his garage. Was at Stanford building solar. He was so good at it, he got hired away, left Stanford to help a giant company ramp up. And when he came back to the sector, he realized that the panel side of it and photovoltaics had now exploded. The cost had come down so much and with solar available, the new big problem is storing all that clean energy. And everybody talks about the intermittency problem. And so he looked at various ways to store solar or wind power and settled on basically a hot rock in a box. Yeah, tell us more about that. <laughs> yeah, this is a giant block. of he, he, His device, his thermal batteries are about the size of a big shipping container or, a, you know, a small house. And basically, it's an insulated box, and inside is a block of super dense carbon, which is very common. You know, there's trillions of tons of this stuff around the world, so it's readily available. Right now, the test project is out in California, and he uses solar power to heat up that rock until it glows like the sun. 
with enough heat to power a factory, and like with using liquid to transfer the heat, or by cracking open the box, like at the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark, the light that shoots out of this rock, you can capture more energy with different kinds of solar panels, right? And so you get electricity and heat from the same product. Right now, when you walk around New York City, I'm sure you've seen it, you'll see steam coming out of the streets, right? <laughs> and I lived here a long time, and the joke I always use when people are like, what is that? Uh, tour guide said, well, that's since they banned smoking. That's where all the smokers have to go <laughs> under the streets now. <laughs> but what it really is, it's the biggest district heating system in the United States. This is an idea that goes back to the Romans, but 100 years ago, they knew they didn't want a coal-burning stove in every building in New York City. So if you have one source of heat making steam and piping it across under Manhattan, three million people now use that steam. That steam makes cheese in Greenwich Village and it irons shirts at the Plaza Hotel and it climate controls the art at the Metropolitan Museum. And one day soon, it could be made with a hot rock in a box, heated up by a you know wind turbine off a Long Island because Antora is among those in the mix part of these incentives now to try to decarbonize big cities and and scale this stuff up. And so the consumer in New York, five years from now, could see that steam and know that is clean. Like this is... Well, where's the steam coming from now? Is it coming from something that's coal from It's coming from fossil fuels. It was coal for a long time. Now it's natural gas mainly, which was sold to the public as much better alternative than coal, a cleaner (laughs) alternative. Now that, you know, 20 years later, we realize that's only true if it never leaks. Right. And it leaks everywhere. Everywhere. Methane methane is what it is. And it's a massive, it's sort of methane mothra to go with the carbon Godzilla. It's even a bigger problem because it, it has much more heating power in the near term. And so a lot of these ideas, you know, I'm just scraping the surface with one example of people in clean water tech and carbon removal and all these sorts of things that excite me because... When people start to tap into that and connect the dots, I I like to think a wave of decarbonization will follow. Yeah, it should do. Well, one of the things you just mentioned here also is that really the big consumer is industry. Yes. Right? So it's okay for everyday people to convert their houses into passive houses. Yes. And that's, I think, going to happen over time. Like, I don't think that in 50 years we will build new houses that aren't close to being passive. That sounds inconceivable, knowing everything that we know today and and all the incentives. Exactly. And on top of that, they'll have to be fire and hurricane proof. Right. Yes. So how do we get big industry, though, to stop burning fossil, to power their plants, to power their factories or what have you, and use clean energy. Is that something in your mind that has to come from the government to say, okay, now we will no longer have coal-burning power plants. We must have something different. Because I feel like people don't connect those things. Sure. No, you're absolutely right. The Inflation Reduction Act was really good at offering carrots to the public, not a lot of sticks for industry, right? A lot of incentives, very little punishment on the other side. And you're right. We live in sort of the golden age of greenwashing as well, where corporations understand that the public cares enough. They get those poll numbers I rattled off before. And so they want to be on the good side of that with their consumers. And so I think it is incumbent on us as consumers to encourage the ones who can prove they're doing the right things. And really, however you want to move or organize against those who are not doing the right things, you know, obviously nonviolently and politics can have a big part of that. But get this, the greenest state in the U.S. right now is Texas. Texas leads the country in wind and solar. They already have way more wind than anyone else. And they're installing solar much faster than California and Florida. And a couple of Sundays ago, Electricity in Texas was free for about six hours because those turbines were spinning and the sun was shining and there was more than enough energy to go around for everybody. Now that people are coming up with ideas like hot rocks and boxes to catch that and store it, and others have ideas that can store it much longer than a day or two, it's going to draw industry to the wind and sun belts. Not for the temperature like retirees used to chase it, but now I want that free electricity, basically, quote unquote free, to power my aluminum smelting plant, which takes up gobs of energy. My biggest worry is that all this clean technology is going to ramp up at just extraordinary rates, but our demand, our sort of bottomless demand for energy 
is just going to gobble it up and we'll keep burning the old stuff Mm -hmm. along with the new. And a couple of reasons for that. Cryptocurrencies take a lot of energy. There's new modeling that uses less, but AI takes enormous amounts of energy and water and e-waste and stuff that, you know, again, we don't think about when we ask Google an AI question or whatever. But the more we just discuss these things, reward the the virtuous cycles and try to break the ones that are self-destructive. And there needs to be leadership from, frankly, not just our political elected leaders. I'm a big believer in to whom much is given, much is expected, you know, and... Again, you can't use ignorance as a defense anymore. And the COOs and the CFOs and folks in the midnight of their soul know whether their business model is doing a lot more harm than good. And it's incumbent on folks to sort of deal with that on emotionally on, on the best way they can. But again, the vested interests, they're not going gently into a future without their business model. These companies are going to fight to dig and burn the last barrel of oil. You know, it's just human nature. And there are some companies like the Danish oil and natural gas company and are now the leading wind energy company in the world. They saw the future and decided to pivot. There are signs and and there's certainly proof that those who work in fossil fuel, like especially in oil drilling fields, those skills apply directly to geothermal. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. But the business model is different mm-hmm. because once you tap a well, you dig a well 5,000 feet down and find enough hot rocks to create steam forever. Mm-hmm. Well, you don't have to keep exploring anymore. Right. right. And, or pumping it's and, and moving it. Right. <laughs> yeah. And that's the thing about renewable energy. Once you build the infrastructure, it delivers itself to you. <laughs> you don't have to go chasing it under oceans and right, mountains right. and blowing the tops off of ecosystems to go get it. Yeah. Of course, it takes different infrastructure, batteries and minerals, and all of that has, is a whole nother thicket. Yeah. But. No, it's great that you said that it delivers itself to you. <laughs> you know, there are a bunch of other things you talk about in your book, about farming practices, about how to have more resilient food, hurricane, resilient housing. That was a great story. Yeah. There are so many avenues to tackle carbon Godzilla and or to simply reduce our carbon footprint, for example, by not having to rebuild a new house after a hurricane, exactly. right? Exactly. So of all the things that you've covered, what are you most excited about? It is. It all goes back to the idea that all of our greatness as a human race started with a story. It started with a group of guys getting together and said, what if we started a country called the United States? What if we, instead of burning whales, what if we shifted over to this fuel source, to kerosene, which at the time made sense? And that people can pivot. Change can take a long, long, long time. But then, boom, when it when, when forces align, you can see the adaption to these new ways and to where you don't even think about it anymore. I was raised my whole life, absolutely never get into a car with a stranger. I came here to see you by calling a stranger <laughs> with an app on my phone. And the entire economy shifted around changing that story, you know, mm-hmm. and trusting each other to use rideshare, right? And so the more I think people realize that the political boogeymen that are set up around this are not real and that there are smarter, healthier, more resilient choices that can be more profitable, you know? In the end, it just gives me hope that we can turn this this around and just got to start talking about it a lot more than we do. We do. Well, it's an election year. Yes. So we are talking about climate, not as much as we should because there are other things happening, of course, in the world today, as we all know. So what's on the table when it comes to climate policy this year in 2024 during this election cycle? What are you watching right now in this space as you ramp up to election day? Well, I mean, there could not be a starker choice when it comes to presidents this election year. You know, Joe Biden signed the most ambitious climate legislation, not just with the Inflation Reduction Act, but the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act. Donald Trump is vowing to unwind a lot of that. He will pull the United States back out of the Paris Climate Accords. There was an analysis I did recently. It's kind of hard to pin down this science, but they were trying to claim that the difference that if Trump wins, it would mean an extra 4 billion gigatons of carbon, you know, in the atmosphere at the end of his term than otherwise would be. I do think that the economics, as I talked about in Texas, are so powerful that regardless of who wins, that's going to continue because a CEO or whatever might vote 
a certain way, but at the end of the day, if it's cheaper to produce their product in a clean way, they'll take that path. What I'm watching is to see whether Democrats lean into this. And there are people, pundits that I've read, who say Biden shouldn't talk about climate at all because most Americans don't care. As you, the point that you, kind of you've been making, there's a disconnect. The, the other side can demonize you and, and call you a bunch of hippies, and it's just too easy to muddy the whole thing and confuse people and scare them away from EVs and make it a culture identity thing, you know? And I think we have to brace for that. You know, what I'm trying to teach my kids is that human nature is going to determine their fate as much as nature itself as it changes. And that can be scary given the choices. But if you do polling and say, would you pay $10 a month to help avert climate change? And most Americans say, no, they wouldn't. So they've yet to sort of connect what their lives mean and what the bigger story means, I think. Well, I think that's why those stories about having energy-efficient homes is so powerful, because this is beneficial to them, their bottom line. Exactly. And their homes. Right, right. Or the idea that with an electric school bus, it will come pick up your kids, no fumes on the ride, no fumes at the stoplight. And then the school can plug into the bus and power their classrooms after dark. You know, that battery in the bus is now a movable power source. Light bulbs are going off, pun intended, around those sorts of things. But the way it is so demagogued by Republicans, this current crop of Republicans, and I like to remind people that Teddy Roosevelt was a Republican, (laughs) created the national parks, really believed that conservative and conservation were rooted in the same words. The Clean Air and Clean Water Acts were passed with massive Republican support. Nixon tried to veto the Clean Water Act and was overrided by the Senate, which just seems crazy now. But then again, at the time, you could see the problem. You could see the air in Los Angeles. You could see the burning rivers in Ohio. You could see the dying bald eagles. Since we've cleaned all that up, it makes climate denial that much easier. Mm For Donald Trump to say we have the cleanest air and water in the world. We don't. You know, we can measure it. We know we don't. But it's not as obvious as it was before. And so Democrats shying away from this, I don't know. I am a journalist, so I don't have a dog in the fight on policy. I do think that it's the biggest issue of our time. And the more they can talk about the dream of a cleaner, more resilient future, the warnings are there. And so some people are going to be motivated by fear. And some people are going to be motivated by profit. And some people are going to be motivated by mama bear. I got to protect my kids. So I'm going to invent a new way to build a house or. Yeah. So what can people do if you are a motivated person? Right. What are two things an everyday person can do to demand that decarbonization is a priority in public policy? Well, it is very much you can vote and vote up and down the ticket. Really get into the weeds, if you can, on your local elections and understand your positions and get your local candidates on record of those sorts of things. That's an obvious one. It is pestering the brands that you believe in, even an email saying, what is your sustainability? But my answer to this generally is, well, what are you into? What are you good at? You know, whatever touches your heart, if you love wildlife, Rally around community around that. And as you do, you'll make connections about politics. You'll understand policy. You'll discuss these things. One idea I I talk about in the book is the resurgence of beavers as these great planetary healers. Beavers are being reintroduced in places to create watersheds and bring back watersheds that have been depleted. And out west, just by mimicking beavers, by making sort of check dams on arid land and slowing down the rainfall, it brings back grasses and wildlife. And and so that just takes neighbors getting together and rearranging rocks and talking about weather patterns. But in those interactions, that's where relationships can come up and political movements can be born. I, I said about before, I don't have a dog in the policy fight, but I will say the one idea of the Inflation Reduction Act that excites me the most is a civilian conservation corps. And they're, they're just about to open up applications for this. And this goes back to sort of the New Deal FDR when when folks who were out of work during the Depression were sent to cut trails in Yellowstone and fight forest fires or rebuild mangrove ecosystems and these, these sorts of things. And the idea that now that young people from Maine and Texas and Colorado will be coming together in these places in nature with people with different ideas with the same purpose. You know, we're truly building a better country for ourselves, better neighborhoods, reconnecting with the natural world and understanding our place in it. 
oh, I think a lot of good will come out. I hope a lot of good comes out of something like that because now we live in the world of sort of ultimate comfort, right? And we're so isolated. And yeah, people can be a pain in the butt. (laughs) And it's easier than ever to avoid them and live a frictionless, isolated life. But now more than ever, we need communities to be talking about these issues and, and taking care of each other, looking out for each other. Are we safe here? What's our building codes here? Hey, do you guys think about what we'll do in a, you know, name your disaster wherever you happen to live? What are our plans? What are contingencies? And from that sort of grassroots interaction, taking that up and looking with eyes wide open what the politics are locally and nationally beyond. Mm-hmm. Good advice. So as we're closing our conversation here today, of all the things that you've researched and done and the things you, you were just talking about, looking into the future, what makes you hopeful? Hmm. What makes me hopeful is that there's always a better story if we just rally around it. And that hopefully this age of sort of disenlightenment, the fever will break somehow and we'll come out of this stronger and more resilient. I have to believe that. What gives me hope is I do believe that by and large, humans are a net positive for planet Earth. And I can hear my dad's voice going, no, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, people can't see this because this is audio, but my eyebrows just, just raised. Well, yeah. <laughs> I just think that, that people, obviously, there are exceptions, and we're, we're living through some really dark time in human history right now. But the sum total of folks who get up every day, and we all care about so much of the same things, And that's why I really wanted to strip it down to our basic pyramid of needs and thinking about the air and water and food our children are taking in and our communities, the kinds of shelter we're building, the kind of energy mixes we're having. And by sort of attacking those very practical challenges together, you can fill the love and esteem needs that we're chasing with yoga retreats or buying new shoes or whatever it is that try to fill that disconnection that we have. What gives me hope is that I will find that for my son. When I focus back to thinking globally, I have to, it's my job, but acting locally gives me the hope and excitement is taking the ideas that I found on this journey to try to impart to him and actually building them in real life. No better cure, I think, for depression or anxiety than action, right? You can't think your way into moving a different way, but you can move your way into thinking a different way. You can get up out of your chair. You can go meet some people. You can go move rocks around like a beaver to create beaver dams and turn anxiety into action and conversation. Yes. Here, here. We are all about the action here at Future Hindsight, so we agree with you wholeheartedly. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much, Bill, for joining us. It was really a pleasure to have you on the show. I hope it was okay. It was so easy to talk to you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Bill Weir is CNN's chief climate correspondent, and his first book, Life As We Know It Can Be, is out now. Next week on Future Hindsight, we're joined by Debbie Cox Bolton. She's the CEO of the New Deal, a national network of select, pro-growth, progressive state and local elected leaders. They're doing a lot of work with their members on defending democracy, and they even have a whole playbook of what state leaders should be doing in the lead-up to Election Day. That's next time on Future Hindsight. And before I go, first of all, thanks so much for listening. If you like this episode, you'll love what we have in store. Be sure to hit that follow button on Apple Podcasts or the subscribe button on your favorite podcast app so you'll catch all of our upcoming episodes. Thank you. Oh, and please leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. It seems like a small thing, but it can make a huge difference for an independent show like ours. It's the main way other people can find out about the show. We really appreciate your help. Thank you. This episode was produced by Zach Travis and me. Until next time, stay engaged. This podcast is part of the Democracy Group.